Welcome back to Norwood Prime Time. We're having a blast here tonight. With me now, on my left, is a guy who worked as Ruth Lyons' radio announcer and sidekick a number of years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Paul Jones. How are you, Paul? Well, I'm okay, but uh, why do you have me on with all these old broads? <laughs> I mean, they talk about their aches and pains, and they can't do this and that, you know. You yeah, I'm gonna punch me out, okay. Well, I'm doing pretty good. Good, I'm glad to hear it. You know, I think people may remember you, you know, uh, what, I W... I doubt that. <laughs> well, you were on WKRC, though, for a number of years as a, well, a staff. after that. After right, that, yeah. after you left uh, radio. What was Ruth Lyons like on radio? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh... Ruth was just a, a great person, as has been said so many millions of times, and it's all true, because you don't have to say it if you don't want to. Now, I didn't know Ruth uh, before we started the old 50 Club, if you, some of you may remember it, back in 1946. Uh, I knew she was a KRC, and I was at LW, and I went in service, and then I came back. Uh, early, I think it was 3rd or 4th of January, 46, and I'd pass her in the hall, we'd pass rather, and you know, hi, how are you? And that was about it, I didn't know her. Then all at once, I think it was about March or something, uh, Peter Grant, he was in charge of all the announcers, we had a whole bunch of them. But anyway, and he says, you're gonna do a show with Ruth, and, and this and that, and this and that, and I don't think we'd planned a daggone thing. It seems to me that we, uh, got together one time and said, well, we'll go down and we're going to do it from the Gibson Hotel from up in the mezzanine. We'll have 50 people there. And, uh... uh you say you didn't plan a thing? No, there was... Well, a lot like this show tonight, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just well, kidding. It was, it was uh, you know, basically planned out, but not uh, as far as, uh, you know, at five after we'll do this, it went on at noon and went to 12.30. It was only a half-hour show. And uh, it, it seemed like it got through in a hurry all the time because, well, R Ruth, you know, would do most of the talking. I would introduce it. I'd do the commercials, two P&G commercials. You won't say which ones they were. But uh, they, they stayed with us all the time. She was on radio. Now, l let me ask you about that, that name of the show. It was called The 50 Club and then changed to The 50-50 Club. And uh, how did you determine how many 50s to use in the title? Well, I don't, I don't know whose idea it was, probably Ruth's. I mean, she had all the ideas as far as 50 club. In other words, we'll have 50 ladies or 50 people. So it's based on the number of people in the audience. Well, and the 50-50 club, I think you, they ran it up to 100 people, right? You old bronze? <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to get your mics now. They're on your seats. When I auditioned for that show, um, Ruth was changing the show that day to 100 people. And she was in the studio moving all the tables around herself with help, with help, but she was pushing. I want this here and this here. And I was so scared to have to audition in front of her. I'll you bet. Know. And she acted like she didn't even know I was there, <laughs> really, until I really got into the audition. Cliff did the audition with me and his band. But it was a frightening day. But that's the day that I auditioned is when they made a 50, 50 club. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul, uh, I, had, I had read in Ruth's own book that she had to drop quite a bit of weight when she moved from radio to television. Uh, she had to get ready to be, that, that picture on the screen now was involved. She was going from radio to television. She had to drop some 25 pounds. Well, I don't know whether she had to do it or not, but Ruth was always, oh, I'm too heavy. I've got to do this, you know, every time. And we would have lunch there on the mezzanine at the Gibson before the show. Uh, and she was always, you know, a little salad about two inches around or something like that. And I'd sit down and have a great big sandwich, you know, and her mouth would drool. But she was always dieting. And sometimes it worked well and sometimes it didn't work so well. <laughs> now, you said that you worked with Peter Grant uh, and he essentially, I guess, hired you or he had a lot to do with hiring you. Well, tell me a little bit about Peter because I should, I should mention to our viewers that I was in touch with Peter Grant. If you don't mind, I'm going to try, I'm going to go through my file here. I, he sent me a letter, just a delightful letter, and I'd like to read it. We tried to get him on the show and he retired in 1969 and he said, Terry, you're a nice guy but, uh, and you know, wonderful, but I just can't do it. I retired and want to keep it that way. And I can't find the letter. Now, let me oh. see. Um, go through. Go through. Oh, Pete was. Pete was always that way. I mean, 
Yeah, my, uh, Bonnie, my eyes are starting to go. Yeah, it's... Well, I can tell you a little bit about Pete Grant. Now, to me, Pete Grant is one of the two or three fellas that I think are the greatest in the world. I mean, my dad, of course, was the first and a couple of brothers and all that, but Pete Grant is a terrific guy. I'm so sad that he didn't show up tonight because I haven't seen him in years. You've got the wrong file, kids. That's right. You get, right here. Here it is. Right. Now, I'll read it to you. This is the one to I was trying to remember which file I had. Now, it says, Dear Terrence Loftus, because that's why I, I signed my letter. He, he was... <laughs> that's my name. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, now... I, I should tell you that, you know, Peter Grant was another one of these people who was legendary and didn't realize he was. What a fine announcer. And in fact, in the book that was written about WLW, when he was on the air, his voice was very similar to the voice of FDR. They could make it even more similar if he wanted to, just for a gag. We used to do that once in a while, make him talk. Yeah, so Franklin Roosevelt's voice and his were very similar, and they, they asked him to change that, did they, uh, to, to style it differently. I don't remember that at all, because Pete was Pete, and that's the way it was. Well, I've read that in the book, but who knows? The book could be wrong. Now, um, dear Terrence Loftus, I've had uh, just a nice letter. He's, I wrote him a letter. I did not talk to him in person. He said, I've had your splendid letter in hand now for several days and have read it through carefully twice. Some parts of it more often than that, he says, and thought about your proposal a good deal. He says, you are quite persuasive, you know. In fact, so persuasive, I wouldn't trust myself to talk with you on the telephone lest you induce me to do something I strongly prefer not to do. Here then is my reply in a nutshell. My retirement, beginning in 1969, has been complete, and I very much wish to keep it that way. So the response to your kind invitation is a gentle but firm declination. Thank you for requesting my participation in the Ruth Lyons Reunion Christmas Special. It is certain to be well and widely received. And we think of you, Pete, we really do. Peter Grant, everybody. When you were in uh, radio and television, what was an announcer? What, what did you do? Did you stand by a microphone and wait for commercial breaks? Or what? I, want, I always wondered what these staff announcers did. Well, you were supposed to stay in the studio. They had announced studios and they had larger studios, you know, for a small live show or uh, large studios for an audience and all that. And uh, you were supposed to stand by because a lot of times then the network, they didn't tell you when they were going to break it. You thought, well, on the hour, on the half hour or something like that. And so you'd be out playing around, and the 20 after, they'd give a station break, and there isn't anybody there. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little embarrassing at times, but uh, mainly, uh, as we've talked a little while ago, there are no announcers anymore. Now everybody's a specialist. They're sports, they're news, or a weatherman. That's right. And that's just about it. But and that's a shame. Well, I don't know whether it's a shame, but... Uh, I know when I came here, they expected me to be able to do everything, and all the other announcers. They had 35 announcers when I came in 39. That was when uh, Crosley owned both WSAI and WLW, and they were together out in the Crosley factory. They'd say, I know one time, uh, they said, uh, you and a fellow named Ken Peters, who was, went out west and made some movies later on, he was only his third day there, and this was Saturday, and he says, tomorrow, you two go down and cover the Mideast Motorboat Brigada. Hell, I'd never seen a motorboat. But, I mean, been in one because I lived there in West Virginia, and there didn't have very many at the, in those days. Right. And Ken didn't know anything about them. But we went down on the motorboat and uh, rather on the, one of the wharf boats and broadcast a half hour to Mutual Network. You had to do whatever they asked you. Well, yeah. And then I had to do a classical program. I was talking to Cliff, uh, Cliff Lash about it a little bit ago. Uh, I'd have to ask the musicians, how do you pronounce this guy's name? <laughs> Tchaikovsky or Puccini or whatever, huh? Yeah, well, I had trouble with those smaller ones, even. Well, Smith and Jones, huh? Yeah. And uh, how do you pronounce this, you know, and that? Because I didn't know. But they, I'd phoneticize it the way they'd say, and uh, got by real easy. But you had to do, in other words, they didn't expect you to have to learn to do it. You had to know it when you came in, you were supposed to. They ask you to do something, you did it. Well, Paul, we want to thank you for your perspective on radio and, and your career and uh, sharing some time with us. I want, you, I want you to leave. I want you to stay here now. I'm not going to leave. I, I want to say one thing to, to Bonnie, though. You better not run into McCluskey. That guy's Irish. He's not Scotch. I thought he was. He, he's, he's, oh, oh, no, he's Scottish. 
He is Irish. Is he really? Okay. Let's take let's take a poll from oh the audience. Oh my to be, Lance! Listen, we. I will. I. Oh my goodness! Well, I don't know why. I always thought he was Scotch Irish. Alongside the snoot. <laughs> hey, listen. We got it, Paul. Thanks. We yeah. got to take a break, real briefly. We're going to be back in just a minute. Let's hear okay. it for Paul Jones.